Hey everyone, welcome back to my show. I apologize that I've been gone for about 12 months. I haven't, my last recording was about, I think 12 months ago. I have not been able to produce content because as some of you know, I moved to a farm, didn't have internet really, and live off grid right now. And it became really difficult to produce content. And uh, though many of you, and a shout out and appreciation to, to y'all who reached out to me on a weekly basis, asking me for to come back to promoting stuff and recording, it was very difficult. And to your pleas did not fall on deaf ears. And here I am back to teaching Maimonidean principles uh, on YouTube. So without further ado, let's talk about the subject that's on many people's minds all over the news, which is the war in Ukraine. And what I'm going to be doing today is just going through a very basic analysis of current events but with a deep insight of Maimonides in similar subjects and what his kind of general approach, how that general approach will help illuminate and understand both current events in the world we live in, but also our own lives and how to manage our own relationships and our own uh, interactions with other people. So let's talk about Ukraine. Ukraine has been at war with Russia for the last 200 and I think 15 days or 210 days. And at the beginning when Russia invaded or began its invasion of Ukraine, it assumed and told everyone, oh, this war is gonna take us a few days or maximum a few weeks. We're gonna invade Kiev. Ukrainians know that they're actually Russians. There's gonna be no more Ukraine and it's just gonna be a part of the Russian Federation. And that did not happen, and not only did that not happen, but recently there was a reversal, and Ukrainians actually uh, fought back and took back many of the villages and towns that the Russians um, uh, took before, that the Russians invaded in the past. And it surprised many people. A lot of the analysts that I follow, professional military analysts who do this for a living, were saying just weeks before that that Ukraine is really close to... Um, to, to surrendering, they can't take it, their, their army is collapsing. Our family members who are involved in this kind of thing were all predicting a complete disintegration of the Ukrainian defense. And, 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 and it, just, it, was, it was a big surprise to many people, especially the experts. And I'm not going to say that I knew better than anyone else, I didn't. Um, but from my study of of, of my learning, those of you who've interacted with me know, I doubted how well the Russians were doing. And the reason I doubted, we're going to see in the class going forward. Turns out my doubts were correct. So without inside knowledge, without, I don't have access to any like channels and telegram where soldiers are telling you the real, I don't have any of that. All I have is what, I, what you guys see, the news media, alternative news media online, but an understanding of human nature that we get from the Torah. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. So let us begin. Um, let's bring up a source in the Mishneh Torah. Quick reminder, what is the Mishneh Torah? Mishneh Torah is Maimonides' synopsis, summary, restatement of the entirety of Jewish law. And it's so comprehensive that it doesn't just talk to you about whether you can reheat your soup on Shabbat on a, uh, on, on, a, on a flame, but it also talks to you about what to do when you're faced with war and how to conduct yourself in war and how to plan for a war in, in, from the context of Jewish law. And when you read through Maimonides, and I encourage you all to do so, the wisdom you get from it, the insights you get from it are endless, beautiful, and it'll enrich your life immeasurably, as it has mine. And that's the purpose of my channel. And here is yet another example of the great wisdom of Rabenu. That had we, uh, had people thought about that, they would have understood, um, you know, the, 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 they would have understood current events much more than they do. Now, of course, it's overlaying on the screen. I'm not 
creative technologies is the best they can do. Please bear with me. Okay. So here we have a law. This is part of the laws of war, right? The laws of wars, kings and their wars. So one of the more odd laws is that we'll read the English one. When a siege is placed around the city to conquer it, it should not be surrounded on all four sides, only on three. The place should be left for the inhabitants to flee, and for all those who desire to escape with their lives, it is written in Devarim, I mean in Bamidbar, they besieged Midian as God commanded Moses, and there's a tradition that you're not allowed to um, surround your enemy on all four sides, pushing them into this ultimate state of desperation. And the reason that Chazal, that our sages have, have brought, is not a humanitarian one directly. It's not that we have mercy on our enemies. In a war, you want to win. Whatever it takes to win, that's pretty much what you do, with several small limitations. For example, killing women and children, obviously. It's also in the laws of war. Also, you're not allowed to destroy fruit trees, to starve your enemy and destroy the environment because you have a, like a territorial conflict. You don't destroy the territory itself. But I digress. That's not relevant to what, the point I want to bring out now. The point I want to bring out is that the reason we can't completely encircle our enemies is because that raises the motivation level of their fighters and puts them in a state of desperation that ultimately endangers you. Because if your enemy is completely desperate, what they will do is fight harder. You guessed it. And when they fight harder, they will uh, more of your people will die. Not only will more of your people die, but the, war, the entire war can turn around based on this, um, the, uh, on the change in motivation. Because there's a today it's known. Uh, there's many good books about this out there. I, I don't remember the name right now. I should probably put it in the description. Uh, there are many great works that discuss the psychology of war, and it turns out that a, a, a very important element that's very hard to measure. You can measure troop numbers. You can measure ammunition, training, and you can make predictions based on that. But where those predictions go wrong is human nature. We can't predict how much motivation each side has. So Russia predicted that the Ukrainians want to be Russians and don't want to be Ukrainians. So they assumed that the fight they're going to face won't be very hard. They didn't expect the Ukrainians to take their national identity as seriously as they did and fight as hard as they did. So when you, um, when you encircle your enemy and put them in a state where the only way out is to fight, then the percentage of high motivation fighters in their ranks goes up. And your fighters will have to, or your army will have to contend with a much stronger enemy. If you leave them a narrow way out of any sort so they can escape, you don't have to fight. So you lower their numbers and also the motivation of those that stay is not as desperate. And therefore, the fighters you have before you are not giving their all. They're not giving as much as they would if they're... You have no choice. It doesn't mean that you cannot win a war when you encircle your enemy. You can. But when you do that, you're losing more of your own men and more resources in that war because you push too hard. And that's a, a, a very difficult dichotomy. It's a contradiction in terms because when you're aggressively trying to win a war, you don't think that you sometimes need to take a step back and actually not be as belligerent as you would like to be because by being that stubborn, by being that strong against your enemies, you force them into a position of desperation. And from that desperation, they can in fact turn around and defeat you. It's an important concept to have. So in this case, Russia did not announce, we just want Ukraine to kind of be neutral and, uh, and have a just not fight us, and you know, we're defending our borders and our safety, and we don't want NATO bases here. They actually were saying things like, oh, we're going to stop Ukraine from existing because Ukraine is historically a part of Russia. And they put Ukrainians on a defensive in a way where they felt they need a fight to exist because they, they just wouldn't stop existing if the Russians win. Had the Russians been a little, and that's, had the Russians been a little softer in their declaration, in their attacks, politically even, that would have kind of made many Ukrainians think twice about going to war. And even if they wanted to go to war, they probably wouldn't have risked their lives 
as hard as they did when they are being pushed to their, you know, to their dignity, limits of their dignity. And uh, you can say the same thing about how the war was fought. In many cases, the sieges were completely encircled them. So they kept on uh, reinforcing this idea to their opponents that they have no choice in this war. And they actually, with their own aggression, they've improved the quality of their enemies, of the ability of their enemies to fight, and actually kind of caused the reversal of their own fortune. And I'm not here to give either the Russians or the Ukrainians advice. I'm here to analyze the situation we see and see how we can apply this in our own lives. So, uh, and the same thing you can say on the other on the other side. You can say, well, today that the Ukrainians seem to be winning, if Ukraine and the West insist on humiliating Russia to complete defeat, that's going to encourage the Russians to not accept defeat come back with a bigger army and maybe win or maybe not, but either way it would cost everyone more lives and more resources. And therefore, the most prudent thing would be, if it's possible, and this is not always possible, is to come up with a solution that would give the Russians an honorable way out, even though they're kind of lost. All right. What does that mean? Some sort of declaration of neutrality, a commitment not to allow foreign armies into Ukraine or some something, so that Putin can go back to his people and say, yeah, we fought a war, it was hard, we lost a lot of people, but you know what, we got a commitment and the world is behind it and now our borders are safe, I've helped you. But if you don't give him that option, then he's going to mobilize a half a million men if he needs, he'll mobilize a million men and he'll come back to fight because he's, again, from a political human perspective, you don't give him an honorable way out. And that's something that um, I think, and this is why, uh, during the worst prognosis of Ukraine's disastrous campaign and how much they're losing and how great Russia is, I suspected, didn't know, and I'm not going to claim to be a prophet, but like, I, I kind of suspected that we're not getting the full picture because, because I saw how aggressive the Russian side was and how hard the Ukrainians were fighting. And I assumed that there's a chance that the Ukrainians actually are doing better than we think. And I didn't see the Russians exactly following Maimonides advice, not that I expect them to, but this kind of tactical, uh, we can call it like a strategic or tactical, uh, uh, easy going, like just a, a, a moderation, a tactical moderation. If you're come off as moderate to your enemies, they won't fight you that hard. But if you come off psychotic to your enemies, you push them into a place where they will fight you like demons. And this is something I can bring you examples from Jewish history. In the Six Day War, if you look at that, um, the Arab states were not saying we want to stick up for the Palestinians and give them a state, and therefore we're going to fight the Israelis. What they said is we're going to throw the Jews into the sea and kill them all and take them women, hostages, you know, slaves, whatever. They, they were pretty open, and they were using genocidal language against a nation that actually suffered genocide before us, that has PTSD against genocide. So the, the, I think that one can argue pretty easily and convincingly that the Arab aggression and belligerence leading up to June 4th, 1967, otherwise known as the Six-Day War, created a level of uh, defensiveness and fighting motivation among the Israelis, among the Jews, that actually destroyed the same Arab attacks. Now, had they studied Maimonides, they wouldn't have went to war in the first place. But let's say they went to war. They, the way they would have planned it was they would have used language of, oh, peace and fighting for the civil rights of the Israeli Arabs and Bedouins somewhere were not being treated well, and the Palestinians and Israel, of course they can be a state, but we're not here to wipe out Israel. We're just here to, to, to save our brothers, right? Something like that would have, first of all, it would have motivated the Arab attackers much more because they would feel, okay, we're fighting for a noble cause. We're not fighting to wipe out some people. Like the force of hatred is not as motivational as, and that's another chapter in my we need to study. You want to motivate people and appeal to their sense of justice. So when you say, I'm going to wipe you out, that's 
it actually damages because when a push comes to shove, do you really want to risk your life to hurt someone or were you willing to risk your life for nobility? So you'd be a martyr for some of the greater good. But not just that, they, the Israelis themselves would have been divided about the war and some Israelis would have said, well, maybe we aren't treating the Arabs correctly and maybe this war could have been prevented and the mobilization that the Israelis had wouldn't have been as strong as it was and maybe they would have won. They may have lost anyway, but they would have had a higher chance of winning. That's the point. Um, here are other examples in our history that one can mention, like the siege of Jerusalem by Rome. Rome besieged Jerusalem on all sides and starved their inhabitants. And yes, they, Rome defeated Judea, took, destroyed the temple, and they got. They, you think they got what they wanted, but what did it cost them? How many legions were wiped out? So if, had they been more benign in their approach to the conflict, they would have had more. They had many Jews on their side, but that was kind of a good thing. Like, good, strategically a good thing to do, but more Jews would have been on the Roman side. And instead, they kind of pushed more and more moderate Jewish factions into a uh, belligerent anti-Roman stance. And similarly with Russia, and as I said, it goes both ways. Now, all of this is current events, from to kind of highlight a point. But in the next segment, I want to bring it home, bring it home to your practical life, how you can apply these principles in your daily life okay so this is a very broad idea and you can take this to your family drama fight or a business dispute or an argument with your romantic partner or fight with your neighbors all of that can be um you could do all of that and you would still you, you would still uh, the principle would stand which is if you put people in a corner and you don't allow them an honorable way out, they're going to uh, they're they're going to be so desperate in their attempt to defeat you that verbally or financially that you're going to have a much harder fight in front of you. So even if you're in a debate with someone and they're high up on a tree where they kind of corner themselves, your job now as the victor, okay, as someone who's kind of winning, is to give them an honorable way to kind of back out of their uh, stance, okay? And that's not always an easy thing to do because your momentum is forward. But right now, at that point, you, you can create a desperate enemy or at that point, you can create an ally or someone who submits to, 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 to your argument. And it is a very broad idea and you can apply it in many different ways, right? So, um, and I encourage you to think about these things and your interactions with human beings uh, always leave the other side an honorable and dignified way of backing off. And if you're not being given an honorable way to back off and you should back off, it's very hard. You know that from your own experience. If you're arguing with someone in mid-argument, you know you're wrong. You cannot back down and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, because the other side may be pushing you and humiliating you in such a way. And therefore, I encourage you all to... Take that into account and to um, kind of just make you to, to, to treat people in a dignified way, consider their point of view, and even for pure tactical reasons, in order for you to be a more successful um, social animal, you need to uh, allow them, allow them, allow your opponents, allow your friends, allow your family members an honorable way out of messy situations. And if we all live that way, individually and collectively, according to the moderate wisdom of Rabbeinu Harambam and the Torah, uh, sacred tradition, then we would have a much more peaceful world in our personal lives, and also collectively. Thanks for listening, and Shabbat Shalom.